Good evening and welcome to Publish and Be Damned, Series 1, Episode 12. We're still covering the Stoics. We are nearing the end of Seneca, and so hopefully in the next couple of weeks we'll be looking to start uh, Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. But for this evening, we have our quote for the evening, which is from Zeno, and he says, All things are part of one single system, which is called nature. The individual life is good when it is in harmony with nature. Okay. Now, the link for the stream is in the Discord, so anyone who would like to join is more than welcome to. Um, in the meantime, we shall carry on with letter number 105. And Seneca says, Yes, I'll give you some rules to observe that will enable you to live in greater safety. You, for your part, I suggest, should listen as carefully to the advice I give you as you would if I were advising you on how to look after your health at our dear. Now think of the things which goad men into destroying man. You'll find that they are hope, envy, hatred, fear and contempt. Contempt is the least important of the lot. So much so that a number of men have actually taken shelter behind it for protection's sake. For if a person feels contempt for someone, he tramples on him, doubtless, but he passes on. No one pursues an unremitting and persistent policy of injury to a man for whom he feels nothing but contempt. Even in battle, the man on the ground is left alone, the fighting being with those still on their feet. Coming to hope... So long as you own nothing likely to arouse the greed of, or grasping instincts of others, so long as you possess nothing out of the ordinary, um, for people covet even the smallest things if they are rare or little known, you'll have nothing to worry about from the hopes of grasping characters. Envy you'll escape if you haven't obtruded yourself on other people's notice, if you haven't flaunted your possessions, if you've learnt to keep your satisfaction to yourself. Hatred either comes from giving offence, and that you'll avoid by refraining from deliberately provoking anyone, or it is quite uncalled for. Here your safeguard will be ordinary tact. It is a kind of hatred that has been a source of danger to a lot of people. Men have been hated without having any actual enemy. As regards not being feared, a moderate fortune and an easygoing nature will secure you that, People should see that you're not a person it is dangerous to offend, and with you a reconciliation should be both easy and dependable. To be feared inside your own home, it may be added, is as much a source of trouble as being feared outside it. Slave or free, there isn't a man who hasn't the power enough to do you injury. Besides, to be feared is to fear. No one has been able to strike terror into others and at the same time enjoy peace of mind himself. There remains contempt. The person who has made contempt his ally, who has been despised because he has chosen to be despised, has the measure of it under his control. It is, its disadvantages are negatived by the possession of respected qualities and of friends having influence with some person with the necessary having influence with some person with the necessary influence. Such influential friends are people with whom it is well worth having ties without being so tied up with them that their protection costs you more than the original danger might have done. But nothing will help quite so much as just keeping quiet, talking with other people as little as possible and with yourself as much as possible. The conversation has a kind of charm about it an insinuating and insidious something that elicits secrets from us, just like love of li or love or liquor. Nobody will keep the things he hears to himself, and nobody will repeat just what he hears and no more. Neither will anyone who has failed to keep a story to himself keep the name of his informant to himself. Every person, with exception, has someone to whom he confides everything that is confided to himself. Even supposing he puts some guard on his garrulous tongue, and is content with a single pair of ears, he will be the creator of a host of later listeners. Such is the way in which what was but a little while before a secret becomes common rumour. 
Never to wrong others takes one a long way towards peace of mind. People who know no self-restraint lead stormy and disordered lives, passing their time in a state of fear commensurate with the injuries they do to others, never able to relax. After every act, they tremble, paralysed, their consciences continually demanding an answer, not allowing them to get on with other things. To expect punishment is to suffer it, and to earn it is to expect it. Where there is a bad conscience, some circumstance or other may provide one with impunity, but never, never with freedom from anxiety. For a person takes the attitude that even if he isn't found out, there's always the possibility of it. His sleep is troubled. Whenever he talks about someone else's misdeed, he thinks of his own, which seems to him all too inadequately hidden, all too inadequately blotted out of people's memories. A guilty person sometimes has the luck to escape detection, but never to feel sure of it. Letter 107. Where's that moral insight of yours? Where's that acuteness of perception or magnanimity? Does something as trivial as that upset you? Your slaves have seen you have seen your absorption in business as their chance to run away. So be it. You have been let down by friends, for by all means, let them keep the name we mistakenly bestowed on them and be called such just to heighten their disgrace. But the fact is that your friends have but the fact is that your affairs have been freed for good and all of a number of people on whom all your trouble was being wasted and who considered you insufferable to anyone but yourself. There's nothing unusual or surprising about it at all. To be put out by this sort of thing is as ridiculous as grumbling about being spattered in the street or getting dirty where it's muddy. One has to accept life on the same terms as the public baths or crowds or travel. Things will get thrown at you and things will hit you. Life is no soft affair. It's a long road you've started on. You can't but expect to have slips and knocks and falls and get tired and openly wish a lie for death. At one place you will part from a companion, at another you will bury one, and be afraid of one at another. These are the kinds of things you'll come up against all along this rugged journey. Wanting to die? Let that personality be made ready to face everything. Let it be made to realise that it has come to tr terrain on which thunder and lightning play, terrain on which grief and vengeful care have set their couch, and pallid sickness dwells and drear old age. This is the company in which you must live out your days. Escape them you cannot, scorn them you can, and scorn them you will if by constant reflection you have anticipated future happenings. Everyone faces up more bravely to a thing for which he has long prepared himself, sufferings even being withstood if they have been trained for in advance. Those who are unprepared, on the other hand, are panic-stricken by the most insignificant happenings. We must see to it that nothing takes us by surprise, and since it, is, since it is invariably unfamiliarity that makes a thing more formidable than it really is, this habit of continual reflection will ensure that no form of adversity finds you a complete beginner. I've been deserted by my slaves. Others have been plundered, incriminated, set upon, betrayed, beaten up, attacked with poison or with calumny. Mention anything you like, it has happened to plenty of people. A vast variety of missiles are launched, with us as their target. Some are planted in our flesh already. Some are hurtling towards us at this very moment. Others merely grazing us in passing on their way to other targets. Let's not be taken aback by any of the things we're born to. Things no one need complain at for the simple reason that they're the same for everybody. Yes, the same for everybody, for even if a man does escape something, it was a thing which he might have suffered. The fairness of a law does not consist in its effects being actually felt by all alike, but in its having been laid down for all alike. Let's get this sense of justice firmly into our heads and pay up without grumbling the taxes arising from our moral state. Winter brings in the cold, and we have to shiver. Summer brings back the heat 
and we have to swelter. Bad weather tries the health, and we have to be ill. Somewhere or other, we are going to have encounters with wild beasts and with man too, more dangerous than all those beasts. Floods will rob us of one thing, fire of another. These are conditions for, of our existence which we cannot change. What we can do is adopt a noble spirit, such a spirit benef as befits a good man, so that we may bear up bravely under all that fortune sends us and bring our wills into tune with nature's reversals. After all, are the means by which nature regulates this visible realm of hers. Clear skies follow cloudy. After the calm comes the storm. The winds take turns to blow. Day succeeds night. While part of the heavens is in the ascendant, another is sinking. And it is by means of opposites that eternity endures. This is the law to which our minds are needing to be reconciled. This is the law they should be following and obeying. They should assume that whatever happens was bound to happen and refrain from railing at nature. One can do nothing better than endure what cannot be cured and a, one one can do nothing better than endure what cannot be cured and attend uncomplainingly the god at whose instance all things come about it is a poor soldier that follows his commander grumbling so let us receive our orders readily and cheerfully and not desert the ranks along the march the march of this glorious fabric, fabric of creation in which everything we shall suffer is a strand. And let us address Jupiter, whose guiding hand directs his mighty work, in the way our own Cleanthes did, in some most expressive lines, which I may perhaps be pardoned for translating, in view of the example set here by that master of expressiveness, Cicero. If you like them, so much the better. If not, you will at least know that I was following Cicero's example. And Cicero says, Lead me, master of the soaring vault of heaven. Lead me, father, where you will. I stand here prompt and eager to obey. And even suppose I were unwilling still, I should attend you and no suffering, dishonourably and grumbling, when I might have done so and been good as well. For fate the willing leads, the unwilling it drags along. Let us speak and live like that, and let fate find us ready and eager. Here is your noble spirit, the one which has put itself in the hands of fate. On the other side, we have the puny degenerate spirit, which struggles, and which sees nothing right in the way the universe is ordered, and would rather reform the gods than reform itself. Letter number 108. The subject you ask me about is one of those in which knowledge has no other justification than the knowledge itself. Nevertheless, and just because it is so justified, you are in a great hurry and reluctant to wait for the Encyclopedia of Ethics that I am compiling at this very moment. Well, I shall let you have your answer immediately, but first I'm going to tell you how this enthusiasm for learning, with which I can see you're on fire, is to be brought under control if it isn't going to stand in its own way. What is wanted is neither haphazard dipping nor a greedy onslaught on knowledge in the mass. The whole will be reached through its parts and the burden must be adjusted to our strength. We mustn't take on more than we can manage. You shouldn't attempt to absorb all you want to, just what you've room for. Simply adopt the right approach and you will end up with room for all you want. The more the mind takes in, the more it expands. I remember a piece of advice which Attalus gave me in the, in the days when I practically laid siege to his lecture hall. Always first to arrive and last to go, and would draw him into a discussion of some point or, e or other, even when he was out taking a walk. For he was always readily available to his students, not just accessible. A person teaching and a person learning, he said, should have the same end in view, the improvement of the latter. A person who goes to a philosopher should carry away with him something or other of value every day. He should return home a sounder man, or at least more capable of becoming one, and he will, for the power of philosophy is such that he 
she helps not only those who devote themselves to her, but also those who come into contact with her. A person going out into the sun, whether or not this is what he is going out for, will acquire a tan. Customers who sit around rather too long in a shop selling perfumes carry the scent of the place away with them, and people who have been with a philosopher are bound to have derived something from it, of benefit even to the inattentive. Note that I say the inattentive, not the hostile. That's all very well, but don't we all know certain people who have sat at a philosopher's feet year after year without acquiring even a semblance of wisdom? Of course I do. Persevering, conscientious people too. I prefer them to... I prefer to call them a philosopher's squatters rather than students. Some come not to learn but just to hear, in the same way as we're drawn to a theatre, for the sake of entertainment, or to treat our ears to a play or music or an address. You'll find that a large proportion of the philosopher's audience is made up of this element, which regards his lecture hall as a, pl as a place of lodging for periods of leisure. They're not concerned to rid themselves of any faults there, or acquiring any rule of life by which to test their character, but simply to enjoy to the full the pleasures the ear has to offer. Admittedly, some of them actually come with notebooks, but with a view to recording not the content of the lecture, but the words from it, to be passed on to others with the same lack of profit to the hearer as they themselves derive from hearing them. Some of them are stirred up by the noble sentiments they hear. Their faces and spirits light up and they enter into the emotions of the speaker, going into a transport just like the eunuch priests who work themselves into a frenzy to order at the sound of the Phrygian flute. They are captivated and aroused not by a din of empty words, but by the splendour of the actual content of the speaker's words. For any expression of bold or spirited defiance of death or fortune, making you keen to translate what you've heard into action straight away. They are deeply affected by the words and become the persons they are told to be, or would if the impression on their minds were to last. If this magnificent enthusiasm were not immediately intercepted by that discourager of noble conduct, the crowd, very few succeed in getting home in the same frame of mind. It is easy enough to arouse in a listener a desire for what is honourable, for even, ev for in every one of us, nature has laid the foundations or sown the seeds of the virtues. We are born to them all, all of us, and when a person comes along with the necessary stimulus, then those qualities of the personality are awakened, so to speak, from their slumber. Haven't you noticed how the theatre murmurs agreement whenever something is spoken, the truth of which we generally recognise and unanimously confirm? The poor lack much, the greedy everything. The greedy man does no one any good, but harms no person more than his own self. Um, your worst miser will clap these lines and be delighted at hearing his own faults lashed in this manner. Imagine how much more likely it is that this will happen when such things are being said by a philosopher, interspersing passages of sound advice with lines of poetry calculated to deepen their hold on unenlightened minds. For the constricting requirements of verse, as Cleanthes used to say, give one's meaning all the greater force in the same way as one's breath produces a far greater noise when it is channeled through a trumpet's long and narrow tube before its final expulsion through the widening opening at the end. The same things stated in prose are listened to with less attention and have much less impact. When a rhythm is introduced, when a fine idea is compressed into a definite meter, the very same thought comes hurtling at one like a missile launched from a fully extended arm. A lot, for example, is said about despising money. The listener is told, at very considerable length, that men should look on riches as consisting in the spirit and not in inherited estates, and that a man is wealthy if he has attuned himself to his restricted means and has made himself rich on little. 
but verses such as the following he finds a good deal more striking. He needs but little who desires but little. He has his wish, whose wish can be to have what is enough. When we hear these lines and others like them, we feel impelled to admit the truth. The people for whom nothing is ever enough admire and applaud such a verse and publicly declare their distaste for money. When you see them in such a mood, keep at them and drive this home, piling it on them, having nothing to do with plays or word, on words, syllogisms, sophistries and all the other toys of sterile intellectual cleverness. Speak out against the love of money, speak out against extravagance. When you see that you've achieved something and had an effect on your listeners, lay on all the harder. It is hardly believable how much can be achieved by this sort of speech aimed at curing people wholly directed to the good of the people listening. When the character is impressionable, it is easily won over to a passion for what is noble and honourable, while a person's character is still malleable, and only corrupted to a mild degree, truth strikes deep if she finds the right kind of advocate. For my part, at any rate, when I heard Attalus winding up the case against the faults of character, the mistaken attitudes and the evils generally of the lives we lead, I frequently felt a sense of the sorry plight of the human race and looked on him as a kind of sublime being who had risen higher than the limits of human aspiration. He himself would use the stoic term king of himself, but to me he seemed more than a king as being a man who had the right to pass judgment on the conduct and character of monarchs. And when he began extolling to us the virtues of poverty and showing us how everything which went beyond our actual needs was just so much a necessary weight, a burden to the man who had to carry it, I often had a longing to walk out of that lecture hall a poor man. When he started exposing our pleasures and com commanding us, commanding to us, along with moderation in our diet, physical purity, and a mind equally uncontaminated, uncontaminated not only by illicit pleasures, but by unnecessary ones as well, I would become enthusiastic about keeping the appetites of food and drink firmly in their place. With the result that some of this, Lucilius, has lost with me right through life, for I started out on it all with tremendous energy and enthusiasm, and later, after my return to public life, I managed to retain a few of the principles as regards which I had made this promising beginning. This is how I came to give up oysters and mushrooms for the rest of my life, for they are not really food to us but titbits, which induce people who have already had as much as they can to go on eating. Job, the object most desired by gluttons and others who stuff themselves with more than they can hold, being items which will come up again as easily as they go down. This too is why throughout life I have always abstained from using scent, as the best smell a body can have is no smell at all. This is why no wine ever finds its way into my stomach. This is the reason for my lifelong avoidance of hot baths, believing as I do that it is effeminate as well as pointless to stew one's own body and exhaust it with continual sweating. Some other things to which I once said goodbye have made their reappearance, but nevertheless, in these cases in which I have ceased to practice total abstinence, I have succeeded in observing a limit, which is something hardly more than a step removed from total abstinence, and even perhaps more difficult, with some things less effort of will is required to cut them out altogether than to have recourse to them in moderation. Now that I've started disclosing to you how much greater my enthusiasm was in taking up philosophy as a young man than it is when it comes to keeping it up in my old age, I shan't be ashamed to confess the passionate feelings with which Pythagoras, with the passionate feelings which Pythagoras inspired in me. Socian used to tell us why Pythagoras and later Sextius was a vegetarian. Each had quite a different reason, but each was a striking one. Sextius believed that a man had enough food to sustain him without shedding blood, 
and that when man took this tearing of flesh so far that it became a pleasure, a habit of cruelty was formed. He argued, in addition, that the scope for people's extravagance was, in any case, something that should be reduced, and he gave reasons for inferring that variety of diet was incompatible with our physical makeup and inimical to health. Pythagoras, on the other hand, maintained that all creatures were interrelated, and that there was a system of exchange of souls involving transmission, transmigration from one body, bodily form, to another. If we are to believe Py Pythagoras, no soul ever undergoes death or even a suspension of its existence, except perhaps for the actual moment of transfusion into another body. This is not the moment for inquiring by what stages or at what point a soul completes its wanderings through a succession of other habitations and reverts to human form. It is enough for our present purposes that he has instilled into people a dread of committing the crime of parricide, in view of the possibility that they might, all unknowing, come across the soul of an ancestor and with knife or teeth do it dreadful outrage, assuming that the spirit of a relative might be lodging in the flesh concerned. After setting out this theory and supplementing it with arguments of his own, Socian would say, you cannot accept the idea of souls being assigned to one body after another, and the notion that what we call death is only a move to another home. You cannot accept that the soul, which was once that of a man, may sojourn in wild beasts, or in our own domesticated animals, or in the creatures of the deep. You cannot accept that nothing ever perishes on this earth, instead merely undergoing a change in its whereabouts. And that the animal world, not just the heavenly bodies that re revolve in their unalterable tracks, moves in cycles, with its souls propelled along an orbital path of their own. Well, the fact that these ideas are ones which have been accepted by a great by great men, should make you suspend judgment. You should preserve an open mind on the whole subject anyway, for if these ideas are correct, to abstain from eating the flesh of animals will mean guiltlessness, and even if they are not, it will still mean frugal living. What do you lose by believing in it at all? All I am depriving you of is what the lions and the vultures feed on. Fired by this teaching, I became a vegetarian, and by the time a year had gone by was finding it an enjoyable as well as an easy habit. I was beginning to feel that my mind was more active as a result of it. I would not take my oath to you now that it really was. I suppose you want to know how I came to give up the practice. Well, my years as a young man coincided with the early part of Tiberius' reign, when certain religious cults of foreign or origin were being promoted, and among other things, abstinence from certain kinds of food was regarded as evidence of adherence to such superstitions. So at the request of my father, who did not really fear my being prosecuted, but, was, but who detested philosophy, I resumed normal habits. And in fact, he had little difficulty in persuading me to adopt a fuller diet. Another thing though, which Atlas used to recommend, was a hard mattress, and that is the kind I still use even in my old age. The kind which shows no trace of a body having slept on it. I tell you all this just to show you the tremendous enthusiasm with which the merest beginner will set about attaining the very highest goals, uh, provided someone give him the necessary prom prompting and encouragement. Things tend, in fact, to go wrong, Things tend, in fact, to go wrong. Part of the blame lies on the teachers of philosophy, who today teach us how to argue instead of how to live. Part on their students, who come to the teachers in the first place with a view to developing not their character, but their intellect. The result has been the transformation of philosophy, the study of wisdom, into philology, the study of words. The object which we have in view, after all, makes a great deal of difference to the manner in which we approach any subject. If he intends to become a literary scholar, a person examining his Virgil does not say to himself when he reads that magnificent phrase, irrestorable time flies. We need to bestir ourselves 
Oh, sorry, let me try that bit again. If he intends to become a literary scholar, a person examining his Virgil does not say to himself when he reads the magnificent phrase, irrestorable time flies, quote, we need to bestir ourselves. Life will leave us behind unless we make haste. The days are fleeting by, carried away at a gallop, carrying us with them. We fail to realise the pace at which we are being swept along. Here we are making comprehensive plans for the future and generally behaving as if we had all the leisure in the world when there are precipices all around us, close quote. No, his purpose is to note that Virgil invariably uses the word flies whenever he speaks of the swift passage of time. Life's finest days for us poor human beings fly first, the sickness and sufferings of bleak old age, the snatching hand, implacable of a merciless death, creep near. It is the person with philosophy in his mind who takes these words in the way they are meant to be taken. Virgil, he says, never speaks of the hours as passing, but as flying, this being the swiftest form of travel. He is also telling us that the finest ones are the first to be borne away. Then why are we so slow to get ourselves moving, so as to be able to keep up with the pace of the swiftest of all things? The best parts of life are flitting by, and the worst to come. The wine which is poured out first is the purest in the bottle, the heaviest particles and the cloudiness settle to the bottom. It is just the same with human life. The best comes first. Are we going to let others drain it so as to keep the dregs for ourselves? Let that sentence stick in your mind, accepted as unquestioningly as if it had been uttered by an oracle. Life's finest days for us poor human beings fly first. Why finest? Because what is to come is uncertain. Why finest? Because while we are young, we are able to learn. When the mind is quick to learn and still susceptible to training, we can turn it to better ends. Because this is a good time for hard work, for studies as a means of keeping our brains alert and busy, for strenuous activities as a means of exercising our bodies. The time remaining to us afterwards is marked by relative apathy and indolence, and is all the closer to the end. Let us act on this, then, wholeheartedly. Let us cut out all distractions and work away at this alone, for fear that otherwise we may be left behind, and only eventually realise one day the swiftness of the passage of this fleeting phenomenon, time, which we are powerless to hold back. Every day, as it comes, should be welcomed and reduced forthwith into our own possession as if it were the finest day imaginable. What flies past has to be seized at. These thoughts never occur to someone who looks at the lines I have quoted through the eyes of our literary scholar. He does not reflect that our first days are our best days for the very reason that the sickness creep near with old age bearing down on us, hovering over our heads whilst our minds are still full of our youth. No, his comment is that Virgil constantly couples sickness and old age, and not without good reason I can tell you, I should describe old age itself as a kind of incurable sickness. The scholar further remarks on the epithet attached to old age, pointing out that the poet speaks in the passage quoted of bleak old age, and in another passage writes, where dwell wane sickness and bleak old age. There is nothing particularly surprising about this way, which everyone has, of deriving material for his own individual interests from identical subject matter. In one and the same meadow, the cow looks for grass, the dog for a hare, and the stork for a lizard. When a commentator, a literary man, and a, and a devotee of philosophy pick up Cicero's book, The State, each directs his attention in different directions. The philosopher finds it astonishing that so much could have been said in it by way of criticism of justice. The commentator, coming to the very same reading matter, inserts this sort of footnote. There are two Roman kings, one of whom has no father and the other no mother. 
the mother of Servius being a matter on which there is uncertainty, and Ancus, the grandson of Numa, having no father on record. He observes, further, that the man to whom we give the title dictator and read about in the history books under the same name was called the master of the commons by the early Romans. This title survives to the present day in the augural records, and the fact that the person appointed by him as his deputy was known as the master of the knights is evidence that this is correct. He similarly observes that Romulus died during an eclipse of the sun, that the right of appeal to the commons was recognised as early as the period of the monarchy. There is authority for this in the pontifical records, in the opinion of a number of scholars, in particular Phanastalia. When the literary scholar goes through the same book, the first thing he records in his notebook is Cicero's use of reaps for re ipse and seps likewise for se ipse. He then goes on to examine changes in usage over the years, where, for example, Cicero uses the expression, since we have been called back right from the calx by this interruption of his. He notes that the calx was the name which the old Romans gave to the finishing line in the stadium that we nowadays call the Cretia. The next thing he does is assemble lines from Aeneas, and in particular those referring to Scipio of Africa. None, foe nor Roman, can assess the value of his succour and do justice to his feats. From this passage, the scholar claims to deduce that the word succour to the early Romans signified the rendering not merely of assistance but of actual services, Aeneas saying that no one, foe or Roman, was capable of asserting, ass assessing the value of the services Scipio rendered to Rome. Next, he congratulates himself on discovering the source from which Virgil chose to take the following, above whose head the mighty gates of heaven thunder. He tells us that Aeneas filched the idea from Homer, and that Virgil filched it from Aeneas. There being a couplet of Aeneas, preserved in the very works of Cicero's I was mentioning, that being the state, which reads, If any man may rise to heaven's levels, to me alone lie open heaven's huge gates. But enough, or before I know where I am, I shall be slipping into the scholar's or commentator's shoes myself. My advice really is this. What we hear the philosophers saying and what we find in their writings should be applied in our own our pursuit of the happy life. We should hunt out the helpful pieces of teaching and the spirited and noble-minded sayings which are capable of immediate practical application, not far-fetched or archaic expressions or extravagant metaphors and figures of speech, and learn them so well that words become works. No one to my mind lets humanity down quite so much as those who study philosophy as if it were a sort of commercial skill, and then proceed to live in quite a different manner from the way they tell other people to do so. People prone to every fault they denounce are walking advertisements of the uselessness of their training. That kind of man can be of no more help to me as an instructor than a steersman who is seasick in a storm. A man who should be hanging on to the tiller when the waves are snatching it from his grasp, wrestling with the sea itself, rescuing his sails from the winds. What good to me is a vomiting and stupefied helmsman? And you may well think the storm of life is a great deal more serious than any which ever tosses a boat. What is needed is a steering hand, not talking. And apart from this, everything which this kind of man says, everything he tosses out to a thronging audience, belongs to someone else. The words were said by Plato, said by Zeno, said by Chrysippus and Posidonius, and a whole host more of Stoics like them. Let me indicate here how men can prove that their words are their own. Let them put their preaching into practice. Now that I've given you the message I wanted to convey to you, I'll go on from here to satisfy the wish of yours, but I'll transfer what you wanted from me to another, fresh letter, to avoid your coming mentally weary to a subject which is a thorny one and needs to be followed with a conscientious and attentive ear. Letter number 114.
You ask why it is that at certain periods a corrupt literary style has come into being, and how it is that a gifted mind develops a leaning towards some fault or other, resulting in the prevalence at one period of a bombastic form of exposition, and at another of an effeminate form fashioned after the manner of songs. And why is it, and why, and why it is, that at one time approval is won by extravagant conceits, and at another by sentences of an abrupt, elusive character that convey more to the intelligence than to the, than to the ear? And why there have been ears in which metaphors have been shamelessly exploited? The answer lies in something that you hear commonly enough, something which among the Greeks has passed into a proverb, and that is that people's speech matches their lives. And just as the way in which each individual expresses himself resembles the way he acts, so in the case of a nation of declining morals and given over to luxury forms of expression at any given time, mirror the general behaviour of that society, a luxuriant literary style, assuming that it is the favoured and accepted style and not just appearing in the odd writer here and there, is a sign of an extravagant society. The spirit and the intellect cannot be of different hues. If the spirit is sound, if it is properly adjusted and has dignity and self-control, then the intellect will be sober and sensible too, and if the former is tainted, tainted the latter will be infected as well. You've observe, observed, surely, how a person's limbs drag and his feet dawdle along if his spirit is a feeble one, and how the lack of moral fibre shows in his very gait if his spirit is addicted to soft living, and how, if his spirit is a lively and dashing one, his step is brisk, and how, if it is a, if it, and how, if it is a prey to madness or to the similar state of anger, his body moves along in an uncontrolled sort of way, in a rush rather than a walk. Isn't this all the more likely to be the case where a person's intellect is concerned? His intellect being wholly bound up with his spirit, moulded by and responsive to it and looking to it for guidance. The manner in which Massenus lived is too well known for there to be any need to describe the way he walked, his self-indulgent nature and his passion for self-display, his reluctance that his fault should escape people's notice. Well then, wasn't his style just as undisciplined as, the, as his dress was sloppy? Wasn't his vocabulary just as extraordinary as his turnout, his retinue, his house, his wife? He would have been a genius if he had pursued a more direct path, instead of going out of his way to avoid being intelligible. Had he not been as loose in matters of style as he was in everything else? Which is why you'll notice that his eloquence resembles a drunken man's torturous and rambling and thoroughly eccentric. Could there be a worse expression than the bank with mane of stream and woods? And look at men tilling with wherries the channel driving the gardens back with the swallows churning over. What about a person cut, curveting at a woman's beck with lips on billing bent, a sigh the opening of his addresses, neck lolling like a forest giant in his ecstasy? This unregenerate company rummage homes for victuals, raiding them with provisions jars and trading death for hope, but... Hardly should I call as witness on his holy day my guardian spirit, else the wicked of a slander waxlight and sputtering meal, mothers or wives accouter the hearth. When you read this sort of thing, doesn't it immediately cross your mind that this is the same man who invariably went around with casual clothes on in the capital, even when Massinus was discharging the emperor's duties during the absence of Augustus, the officer coming to him for the daily code word would find him in informal attire who appeared on the bench, on the platform, and at any public gathering wearing a mantle draped over his head, leaving both ears exposed, looking just like the rich man's runaway slave as depicted on the comic stage. The same man whose public escort at a, 
escort at a time when the nation was embroiled in a civil war and the capital was under arms and in a state of alarm consisted of a pair of eunuchs and he went through a thousand ceremonies of marriage with his one wife these expressions of his strung together in such an outrageous fashion tossed out in such careless manner constructed with such a total disregard of universal usage, reveal a character equally revolutionary, equally perverted and peculiar. Mecenas' greatest claim to victory is regarded as having been his clemency. He spared the sword, refrained from bloodshed, and showed his power only in his defiance of convention. But he has spoilt this very claim of his by these monstrous stylistic frolics, for it becomes apparent that he was not a mild man, but a soft one. That perplexing word order, those transpositions of words, and those startling ideas which have indeed the quality of greatness in them, but which lose all their effect in the expression, will make it obvious to anyone that his head was turned by overmuch prosperity. It is a fault which is sometimes that of the man, and sometimes that of old age of the age, sorry, where prosperity has spread luxury over a wide area of society, people start by paying closer attention to their personal turnout. The next thing that engages people's energies is furniture. Then pains are devoted to the houses themselves, so as to have them running out over broad expanses of territory, to have the walls glowing with marble shipped from overseas and the ceilings picked out in gold, to have the floors shining with a luster matching the panels overhead. Splendour then moves on to the table, where praise is courted through the medium of novelty and variations in the accustomed order of dishes, making what normally rounds off a meal the first course, and giving people as they go what they used to bef what they used before to be given on arrival. Once a person's spirit has acquired the habit of disdaining what is customary and regards the usual as banal, it starts looking for novelty in its methods of expression as well. At one moment it will disinter and revive archaic or obsolete expressions. At another it will coin new unheard of expressions and give word a new form, give a word a new form. At another, the bold and frequent use of a metaphor passes for good style. There are some who cut their thoughts short and hope to win a claim by making their meaning elusive, giving their audience a mere hint of it. There are others who stretch them out, reluctant to let them go. There are others, still, who do not merely fall into a defect of style, but have a passion for the defect for its own sake. So wherever you notice that a corrupt style is in general favour, you may be certain that in that in that society, people's characters as well have deviated from the true path. In this same way, as extravagance in dress and entertaining are indications of a diseased community, so an aber ab aberrant literary style, provided it is widespread, shows that the spirit has come to grief. And in fact, you need feel no surprise at the way corrupt work finds popularity, not merely with the common bystander, but with your relatively cultivated audience. The distinction between these two classes of critic is more, than, more one of dress than of discernment. What you might find more surprising is the fact that they do not confine themselves to admiring passages that contain defects, but admire the actual defects themselves as well. The former thing has been the case all through history. No genius that ever won a claim did so without a measure of indulgence. Namely, any man you like who has a celebrated reputation, and I'll tell you what the age he lived in forgave him, what it turned a blind eye to in his work. I'll show you plenty of stylists whose faults never did them any harm, and some who were actually helped by them. I'll say this. I could show you some men of the highest renown, men held up as objects of wonder and admiration, in whose case to amend their faults would be to destroy them, their faults being so inextricably bound up with their virtues. 
Besides, there are no fixed rules of style. They are governed by the usage of society, and usage never stands still for any length of time. Many speakers hark back to earlier centuries for their vocabulary, talking in the language of the Twelve Tables. Gracchus, Crassus, and Curio are too polished and modern for them. They go right back to Appius and Coron Canius. Others, by contrast, in seeking to confine themselves to familiar everyday expressions, slip into indistinguished into an indistinguished manner. Both these practices, in their different ways, are debased style. The one is as much a fault as the other. In my view, the first paying undue attention to itself and the second unduly neglecting itself, the former review removes the hair from its legs as well, the latter not even from its armpits. Let us turn our attention to composition. How many species of fault can I show you where this is concerned? Some like it broken and uneven and go out of their way to disarrange any passage with a relatively smooth and even flow. They want every transition to come with a jolt and see virility and forcefulness in a style the irregularities of which jar the ear. With some other literary figures, it is not a case of composition, but of setting words to melodies. So sweetly, softly do they glide along. What shall I say about the kind in which words are held back and kept, keep us waiting for a long time before they make their reluctant appearance, right at the end of the period? What of that like Cicero's, which moves to its conclusion in a leisurely fashion, in a gentle and delayed incline, and unvaryingly true to its customary rhythm. In the field of the epigram, too, faults comprise a tameness and childishness, childishness, or a boldness and daring that oversteps the bounds of decency, or a richness that has a cloying quality, or a barrenness in the outcome, an ineffectiveness, a ringing quality and nothing more. These faults are introduced by some individual dominating letters at the time are copied by the rest and handed on from one person to another. Thus, in Sallust's heyday, abruptly terminated sentences, unexpect unexpectedly sudden endings, and a brevity carried to the point of obscurity, passed for a polished style. Lucius Aruntius, the historian of the Punic War and a man of unusual simplicity of character, was a follower of Sallust and strove after that kind of style. By means of money, he procured an army, hired one, in other words, is an expression found in Sallust. Arruntius took a fancy to this expression, procured, and found a place for it on every page. Saying in one passage, they procured our route. In another, King Hiero of Syracuse procured a war, and in another, this news procured the surrender of the people of Panormus to the Romans. These are merely by way of giving you samples of the practice. The whole book is rife with them. What was occasional in Sallust is a frequent, almost incessant occurrence in Aruntius, which is easily enough explained for where, whereas Sallust hit on such expressions, Aruntius cultivated them. You can see what the result is when some writer's fault is taken as a model. Sallust spoke of wintry rains. Aruntius, in the first book of the Punic War, says suddenly the weather was wintry. In another place, when he wants to describe a particular year as having been a cold one, he says, the whole year was wintry. In another passage, he writes, from there he dispatched 60 transport vessels lightly laden, apart from troops and essential crew, in spite of a wintry northerly gale. He drags the word in constantly in every conceivable place. Sallust, at one point, writes, Seeking amid civil war the plaudits of rectitude and integrity, Aruntius was unable to restrain himself from inserting right at the beginning of his first book mention of Regulus tremendous plaudits. Now these faults and others like them, stamped on a writer's style by imitation, are not themselves evidence of extravagant ways or corrupt attitudes, for the things upon which you base any judgment on a person's psychology must be things peculiar to himself, things that spring from his own nature, 
hot-tempered men having a hot-tempered style, an emotional man, an overexcited style, a self-indulgent man, a soft and flabby one, and so on. And the last is the manner one observes, adopted by the sort of person who has his beard plucked out, or has it plucked out in parts, or who keeps himself close-shaven and smooth around his lips, but leaves the rest to grow, who wears cloaks in flamboyant colours, who wears a diaphanous robe, who is reluctant to do anything that might escape people's attention, who provokes and courts such attention, and so long as he is looked at does not mind whether it is with disapproval. Such is the manner of Massinus, and every other writer whose stylistic errors are not accidental, but deliberate and calculated. It is something that stems from a serious affliction of the spirit. When a person is drinking, his tongue only starts stumbling after his mental faculties have succumbed and given way or broken down. The same applies with this drunkenness. Um, no one suffers from it. Un Sorry, the same applies with this drunkenness of style. No one suffers from it unless his spirit is unstable. See then that the spirit is well looked after. Our thoughts and our words proceed from it. We derive our demeanour and expression and the very way we walk from it. If the spirit is sound and healthy, our style will be firm and forceful and virile. But if the spirit tumbles, all the rest of our personality comes down in ruins with it. The queen unharmed, the bees all live at one. Once she is lost, the hives in anarchy. Again, that's Virgil. The spirit is our queen. So long as she is unharmed, the rest remains at its post, obedient and submissive. If she wavers for a moment, in the same moment, the rest all falters. Good evening or good morning, I suppose, to you, Iron Duke, in the chat. And here, I think we'll actually finish this tonight. We're at our penultimate letter in this book, letter 128. Two. The daylight has begun to diminish, has begun to diminish. It has contracted considerably, but not so much that there is not a generous amount remaining still for anyone who will, so to speak, rise with the daylight itself. More active and commendable still is the person who is waiting for the daylight and intercepts the first rays of sun. Shame on him who lies in bed dozing when the sun is high in the sky, whose waking hours commence in the middle of the day. And even this time, for a lot of people, is the equivalent of the small hours. There are some who invert the function of day and night and do not separate eyelids laden with the previous day's carousal before night sets in. Their way of life, if not their geographical situation, resembles the state of those peoples whom nature, as Virgil says, has planted beneath our feet on the opposite side of the world. And when dawn's panting seeds first breathe on us, for them the reddening evening starts at length to light, and to light their lamps. There are some antipodes living in the same city as ourselves, who, as Marcus Cato said, have never seen the sun rise or set. Can you imagine that these people know how one ought to live when they do not know when one ought to when one ought to live can they really be afraid of death like other people when this is what they have retreated into into their own lifetimes they are as weird as the birds that fly by night they may while away they may while away their hours of darkness to a background of wine and perfume they may occupy the whole of the time they spend, contrarily awake, eating sumptuous dishes, individually cooked too, in a long succession of different courses. But what in fact they are doing is not banqueting, but celebrating their own last rites. At least the dead have their memorial ceremonies during the daytime. Heavens, though, no day is a long one for a man who is up and about. Let us expand our life. Action is its theme and duty. The night should be kept within bounds and proportion of it transferred to the day. Poultry that are being reared for the table are cooped up in the dark so as to prevent them moving about and making them fatten easily. There they languish, getting no exercise, with the swelling 
taking possession of their sluggish bodies and the inert fat creeping over them in their magnificent seclusion, and the bodies of these people who have dedicated themselves to the dark have an unsightly look about them too, inasmuch as their complexions are unhealthier looking than those of persons who are pale through sickness, frail and feeble, with their blanched appearance, in the case of the flesh on the living person is death-like. In their case, the flesh on the living person is death-like. And yet I should describe this as the least of their ills. How much deeper is the darkness in their souls? Their souls are dazed and befogged, envious of the blind. What man was ever given eyes for the sake of the dark? Do you ask how the souls come to have this perverse aversion to daylight? and transference of its whole life into the night time. All vices are at odds with nature, all abandon the proper order of things. The whole object of luxurious living is the delight it takes in irregular ways, and in not merely departing from the correct course, but going to the farthest point away from it, and in eventually even taking a stand diametrically opposed to it. Um when you read something like that, it really prompts you to think about people like, um, you know, the, the kind of Jeffrey Epstein's of this world who, who, who are so fabulously wealthy that the only thing that entertains them is the kind of things that no normal person would think of doing, you know? Um, uh, don't you think it's living unnaturally to drink without having eaten, taking liquor into an empty system and going on to dinner in a drunken state? Yet this is a failing which is common among young people who cultivate their capacities to the point of drinking. Swilling would be a better description of it. In naked groups, the moment they're inside the doors of the public bathhouse, every now and then having a rub all over to get rid of the perspiration brought on by continually putting down the piping hot liquor. To them, drinking after lunch or dinner is a common habit, something only done by rural worthies and people who don't know where the true pleasure lies. The wine that gives a person undiluted enjoyment, they say, is, in, is the wine that makes its way into the system unobstructed instead of swimming about in his food. Intoxication of an empty stomach is the kind that gratifies a man. Don't you think it's living unnaturally to exchange one's clothes for woman's? Is it not living unnaturally to aim at imparting the bloom of youth to a different period of life? Can there be a sorrier or crueler practice than that whereby a boy is never apparently allowed to grow up into a man in order that he may endure a man's attentions for as long as may be? Won't even his years rescue him from the indignity his sex ought to have precluded? Gosh, doesn't that sound like the modern day? Is it not living unnaturally to hanker after roses during the winter and to force lilies in midwinter by taking the requisite steps to change their environment and keeping up the temperature with hot water heating? Is it not living unnaturally to plant orchids on top of towers? or to have a forest of trees waving in the wind on the roofs and ridges of one's mansions, their roots springing at a height which would not have been, which would have been presumptuous for their crest to reach? Is it not living unnaturally to sink the foundations of hot baths in the sea, and consider that one is not swimming in a refined fashion unless one's heated waters are exposed to the waves and storms? Having started to make a practice of desiring everything contrary to nature's habit, they finally end up by breaking off relations with her altogether. It's daylight, time for bed. All's quiet, now for our exercises, now for a drive, now for a meal. The daylight's getting nearer, time we had our dinner. No need to do as the crowd does, to follow the common, well-worn path in life is a sordid way to behave. Let's leave the daytime to the generality of people. Let's have the early hours that are exclusively our own. This sort of person is to me as good as dead. After all, how far can a person be from the grave, and an untimely one at that, if he lives by the light of tapers and torches? 
I can recall a great many people who led this kind of life at one time, with a former praetor among them too, Asilius Buta, the man who had squandered an enormous fortune which he had inherited, and when he confessed his impoverished state to the Emperor Tiberius, was met with the remark, You have woken up rather late. Montanus Julius, a tolerably good poet, noted for his closeness to Tiberius and subsequent fall from favour, who used to give public readings of his verse, took great delight in working sunrises and sunsets into his compositions, hence the remark of Nata Pinarius, when someone was expressing disgust at the way Montanus' reading had continued for a whole day and declaring that his readings weren't worth attending. He said that, I'm quite prepared to listen to him, can I say fairer than this, from sunrise to sunset? When Montanus had just read the lines, The sun god starts his fiery flames to extend, the rosy dawn to diffuse her light, and now that plaintive bird, the swallow, starts to thrust her morsels down the throats of nestlings shrill, with gentle bill supplying each its share with journeys yet to come. One Varus called out, and Buta starts to sleep. Varus was a Roman knight, a friend of Marcus Vinicius, who was always in attendance at good dinners, for which he used to qualify by the sauciness of his tongue. It was he too who said, a little later on, when Montanus had read, The herdsmen now in buyers have stalled their beasts, and night now starts to bring the drowsy world a dreamy stillness. What's that you say? Night is it? Now? I'll go and pay a morning call on Buta. But Buta's upside-down way of life was a byword, and yet, as I said, at one time this sort of life was led by a great many people. The reason why some people live in this sort of way is not that they think that night in itself has any special attraction, but that they get no pleasure out of anything which is usual apart from the fact that daylight is an anathema to a bad conscience, a person who experiences a craving or a contempt for things in proportion to their costliness or cheapness looks down his nose at a form of illumination which does not cost him anything. Moreover, the man who lives extravagantly wants his manner of living to be on everybody's lips as long as he is alive. He thinks he is wasting his time if he is not being talked about. So every now and then he does something calculated to set people talking. Plenty of people squander fortunes. Plenty of people keep mistresses. To win any reputation in this sort of company, you need to go in for something not just extravagant, but really out of the ordinary. In a society as hectic as this one, it takes more than common prof profiligacy to get oneself talked about. Gosh, doesn't that sound like modern day? I once heard that delightful storyteller, Albinovenus Pedo, describing how he has lived above Sextus Papinius. Papinius was a one of the daylight shy fraternity. About nine o'clock at night, I'd hear the sound of whips. What's he doing? I'd ask. And I'd be told he was inspecting the household accounts. About twelve, I'd hear some strenuous shouting. What's that? I'd ask, and be told he was doing his voice exercises. About two, I'd ask what the noise of wheels meant, and be told he was off for his drive. And about daybreak, there would be a scurrying in all directions, a shouting for boys and a chaos of activity among stewards and kitchen staff. What is it? I'd ask, to be told he was out of his bath and had called for his pre-dinner appetizer. His dinner, then, it might be said, exceeded the capacity of his day. Far from it, for he lived in a highly economical fashion. All he used to burn up was the night. Hence Pedo's remark, when some people were describing Papinius as being mean and grasping, and the remark being, I take it you would describe him as being an artificial light addict as well. You needn't be dis surprised to discover so much individuality where the vices are concerned. Vices are manifold, take countless different forms, and are incapable of classification. Devotion to what is right is simple. Devotion to what is wrong is complex and admits of infinite variations. 
gosh, that doesn't that sound like the modern day? I feel like I'm repeating myself here. It is the same with people's characters. In those who follow nature, they are straightforward and uncomplicated. I mean, Seneca's going uh, pretty unpolitically correct here. He is definitely not very woke. Um, let me start that bit again. I've lost my place. <laughs> It is the same with people's characters. In those who follow nature, they are straightforward and uncomplicated and differ only in minor degree, while those that are warped are hopelessly at odds with the rest and equally at odds with themselves. But the chief cause of this disease, in my opinion, is an attitude of disdain for a normal existence. Can't possibly cope with just two genders. These people seek to set themselves apart from the rest of the world, even in the manner in which they organise their timetable, in just the same way as they mark themselves off from others by the way they dress, by the stylishness of their entertaining, and the elegance of their carriages. People who regard notoriety as a reward for misbehaviour have no inclination for common forms of misbehaviour. And notoriety is the aim of all these people who live, so to speak, back to front. We, therefore, Lucilius, should keep to the path which nature has mapped out for us and never diverge from it. For those who follow nature, everything is easy and straightforward, whereas for those who fight against her life, it's just like rowing against the stream. Let me just check. I think we are on the last letter. We are indeed. So... Letter number 20, 123, the final letter in Letters from a Stoic, by Seneca. I've reached my house at Elba at last, late at night and worn out by the journey, which wasn't so much long as thoroughly uncomfortable, to find nothing ready for my arrival, apart from myself. So I'm in bed, recovering from my fatigue and making the best of the of this slowness on the part of the cook and the baker by carrying on a conversation with myself on the vet on this very theme of how nothing is burdensome if taken lightly and how nothing need arouse one's irritation so long as one doesn't make it bigger than it is by getting irritated my baker may be out of bread but the farm manager will have some or the steward or a tenant bad bread yes you'll say well It'll soon turn into good bread. Hunger will make you find even that bread soft and wheaty. One shouldn't accordingly eat until hunger demands. I shall wait then and not eat until I either start getting good bread again or cease to be fussy about bad. It is essential to make oneself used to putting up with a little. Even the wealthy and the well-provided are continually met with frustration by difficult times and situations. It is in no man's power to have whatever he wants, but he has it in his power not to wish for what he hasn't got and to cheerfully make the most of the things that do come his way. And a stomach firmly under control, one that will put up with hard usage, marks a considerable step towards independence. I'm deriving immeasurable satisfaction from the way my tiredness is becoming reconciled to itself. I'm not asking for masseurs, or a hot bath, or any remedy except time. What was brought on by exertion rests. What what is was brought on by exertion rest by exertion, rest is taking away, and whatever kind of meal is on the way is going to beat an inaugural banquet for enjoyment. I have in fact put my spirit to a sort of test and a surprise one too such test being a good deal more candid and revealing. When the spirit has prepared itself beforehand, has called on itself in advance to show endurance, it is not so clear just how much real strength it possesses. The surest indications are the ones it gives on the spur of the moment, when it views annoyances in a manner not merely unruffled but serene, when it refrains from flying into a fit of temper or picking a quarrel with someone when it sees to everything it requires by refraining from hankering after this and that, reflecting that one of its habits may miss a thing, 
but its own real self never need do so. Until we have begun to go without them, we fail to realise how unnecessary many things are. We've been using them not because we needed them, but because we had them. Look at the number of things we buy because others have brought them, or because they're in most people's houses. One of the causes of the troubles that besets us is the way our lives are guided by the example of others. Instead of being set to rights by reason, we're seduced by convention. There are things that we shouldn't wish to imitate, if they were done by only a few, but when a lot of people have started doing them, we follow along, as though a practice had become more respectable by becoming more common. Once they have become general, mistaken ways acquire in our minds the status of correct ones. Nobody travels now without a troop of Numidian horsemen riding ahead of him and a host of runners preceding his carriage. One feels ashamed not to have men with one to hustle oncoming travellers off the road and to show there's a gentleman coming by by the cloud of dust they raise. Everybody nowadays has mules to carry his crystal ware, his myrine vessels and other articles engraved by the hands of master craftsmen. One is ashamed to be seen, to have only the kinds of baggage which can be jolted around without coming to any harm. Everyone's page rides along with their faces smeared with cream in case the sun or cold should spoil their delicate complexions. One is ashamed if there is no member of one's retinue of boys whose healthy cheeks call for protection, protection with cosmetics. With all such people, you should avoid association. These are the people who pass on vices, transmitting them from one character to another. One used to think that the type of person who spreads tales was as bad as any. But there are persons who spread vices, and association with them does a lot of damage. For even if its success is not immediate, it leaves a seed in the mind. And even after we've said goodbye to them, the evil follows us to rear its head at some time or other in the future. In the same way as people who've been to a concert carry about with them the melody and the haunting quality of pieces they've just heard, interfering with their thinking and preventing them from concentrating on anything serious, so the talk of snobs and parasites sticks in our ears long after we've heard it, and it's far from easy to eradicate these haunting notes from the memory. They stay with us, lasting on and on, coming back to us every so often. This is why we must shut our ears against mischievous talk, and as soon as it starts, too, one should talk. Once such talk has made its entry and been allowed inside, it becomes a good deal bolder. Eventually, it reaches the stage where it says that virtue and philosophy and justice are just a lot of claptrap. There's only one way to be happy, and that's to make the most of life. Eating, drinking, spending the money that's been left to you. That's what I call living, and that's what I call not forgetting that you've got to die someday too. The days are slipping by, and life is running out on us, never to be restored. Why should we hesitate? What's the point of being wise? Our years won't always allow a life of pleasure, and in the meantime, while we're while they're capable of it and clamouring for it, what's the point of thrusting austerity on them? Steal a march on death by disposing here and now of whatever he is going to take away. Look at you, no mistress, no boy to make your mistress jealous. Every day you go out sober, you eat as if you had to submit a daily account book to your father for approval. That's not living. That's merely being a part of the life enjoyed by other people. And what madness it is to deny yourself everything and so build up a fortune for your heir, a policy which has the effect of actually turning a friend onto an en- into an enemy, though the very amount, through the very amount that you're going to leave him. For the more he's going to get, the more gleeful he's going to be at your death. As for those sour and disapproving characters, those critics of other people's lives and spoilers of their own, who set themselves up as moral tutors to society at large, you needn't give tuppence for them. You needn't ever have any hesitation when it comes to putting good living before a good reputation. These are voices you must stay clear of, like those which Ulysses refused to sail past until he was lashed to the mast. They have the same power, 
they lure men away from country, parents, friends and moral values, creating expectations in them only to make sport out of the wretchedness of, the, of lives of degradation. How much better to pursue a straight course and eventually reach that destination where, where the things that are pleasant and the things that are honourable finally become, for you, the same. And we can achieve this if we realise that there are two classes of things attracting or repelling us. We are attracted by wealth, pleasures, good looks, political advancement and various other welcoming and enticing prospects. We are repelled by exertion, death, pain, disgrace and limited means. It follows that we need to train ourselves not to crave for the former and not to be afraid of the latter. Let us fight the battle the other way round. Retreat from the things that attract us and rouse ourselves to meet the things that actually attack us. You know the difference, Lucilius, between the postures people adopt in climbing up and descending a mountain. Those coming down a slope lean back. Those moving steeply upwards lean forward. For to tilt one's weight ahead of one when descending and backwards when ascending is to be in league with what one has to contend with. The path that leads to pleasure is the downward one. The upward climb is the one that takes us to rugged and difficult ground. Here let us throw our bodies forward. In the other direction, rein them back. Are you now supposing that the only people I consider a danger to our ears are the ones who glorify pleasure and inculcate in us a dread of pain? No. I think we are also damaged by the people who urge us under colour of stoic beliefs to do what is wrong. They make much of our principle that only a man of wisdom and experience can really love. He's the only man with a natural gift for the art of lovemaking then, they say. And he's equally in the best position to know all about drink and parties. Well, here's a question for discussion. Up to what age is it proper to love young men? This sort of thing may be all right for the Greeks, but the kind of talk to which we would be better to turn our ears is this. No man's good by accident. Virtue has to be learnt. Pleasure is a poor and petty thing. No value should be set on it. It is something we share with dumb animals. The minutest, most insignificant creatures scutter after it. Glory's an empty, changeable thing, as fickle as the weather. Poverty is no evil to anyone unless he kicks against it. Death is not an evil. What is it then? The one law mankind has that is free of all discrimination. Supposition is an idiotic heresy. It fears those it should love. It dishonours those it worships. For what difference does it make whether they deny the gods of, or bring them, for what difference does it make whether you deny the gods or bring them into disrepute? These are things which should be learnt, and not just learnt, but learnt by heart. Philosophy has no business to supply vice with excuses. A sick man who is encouraged to live in a reckless manner by his doctor has not a hope of getting well. And that is the end of Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. Thank you for all those who have listened along with me as we've read through that. Thank you for those who have contributed in some of the various weeks that I have been doing this. We will return next week uh, as we go through our final book in this series, which will be um, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. I'm looking forward to starting on that because hopefully, um, well, some people have suggested they'd be uh, interested in joining in on that one, particularly as they have the book already themselves. So hopefully we'll have some decent contributions and some lively discussions in the weeks ahead. But thank you for all those who have listened as we've worked through Letters from a Stoic. Um, if you've liked what you have heard, uh, if you like any of the content by the Wellington Project, 
for that matter. Please feel free to like, comment, share, subscribe, um, join us in the Discord. The link's in the description. Otherwise, have a very good evening. Have a good weekend.